The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 28th chapter. Glory Glory to you, O Lord. Lord. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven, came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the woman, do not be afraid. I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He has been raised as he said. Come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he has been raised from the dead. And indeed, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message for you. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And suddenly Jesus met them and said, greetings. And they came to him, they took hold of his feet, and they worshipped him. And then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go, tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. I invite you to be seated. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This gospel lesson reminds me um, of a time whenever I was at my first call, a little church in Burton, Texas, which is outside of Brenham. And this is a, a church that I consider to be like a generational church. This is where every Sunday you could find a three-year-old sitting with like a great-grandparent in the same row, and they all have the same last name. Families have been going there for generations. And the same thing would happen if somebody was in the hospital. And it just so happened one time that a matriarch of the family was sick. She was dying. And she was in the hospital. And so they called me to come out to visit with them. And I make my way into the hospital. And there's like 17 or 18 people in this little hospital room. And we're all kind of nudged in there together. And um, we're, we're waiting because this woman, who they called Nana. And I think that's wonderful because that's what we called my mom when the first grandchild was born, Nana. And uh, they were waiting for Nana to take her last breath. And and the family was all packed in there. And they said, well, I tell you what, Pastor, we're going to go get something to eat. And you just do what you do. And I don't know what they were expecting. But (laughs) they all decided they started flooding out of the room one by one by one. Except for one girl. She was about 18 or 19 years old. She was uh, uh, the granddaughter of Nana. And she sat there and said, can I stay? And the family was like, of course, of course. And so they all leave, and it's just the three of us, this girl, Nana, and myself. And she's holding Nana's hand, and then Nana breathes her last. And she looks up at me, and she's sobbing, and she says, she's gone. And we just sit there in the silence for a few moments. And then this young woman begins to smile, and tears start flowing. Then she begins to chuckle, and then she starts laughing. And she's smiling so big, and she's crying, and she's smiling, and she's laughing. And she goes, don't tell them. And and I said, okay. (laughs) She says, don't tell them that I'm laughing. And I said, I won't, sweetie, but why are you laughing? (laughs) And she looks up at me with these tears and these smiles. She says, I just can't even think. What is she seeing right now? Oh faith of this little one. And I think about that story with this gospel because I imagine that's the balance of emotions that those Marys are having as they find out it's real. So Mary and Mary are two wonderful figures in our gospel lesson, but this isn't the first time that we've seen them together. Right before this, Joseph of Arimathea has taken the body of Jesus and he's buried him into the tomb. And he takes a stone and he rolls it over the front of the tomb, and then Mary and Mary are sitting opposite of the tomb, and what I could only imagine is just a state of grief, sadness. They've lost their friend, their rabbi, their teacher. I can't believe what's all happened. And they're just sitting there silently watching the tomb be rolled shut. And then the scene shifts, and Matthew's the only gospel that has this, but there's this scene with the Pharisees and the chief priests and all the religious leaders talking to uh, uh, Pilate and all the Roman leaders. And the Pharisees are looking at them saying, this guy, he's, he's a rabble rouser. His disciples, they're going to come and steal that body. 
And then they're going to say he was resurrected. And then his last deception is going to be worse than his first. You better do something. You know what? You should seal that tomb shut. You should put guards there and protect it. And so Pilate says, go for it. And they do. And the Pharisees dispatch guards. And they're standing in front of the tomb. And they tell the guards to seal the tomb. And every time I think of this, I imagine that Sesame Street book with Grover, the monster at the end of the book. You know the one. Where he's hammering up the wood pages and stuff. He's getting the bricks all in line. He's mortaring it up there. And every time the page turns, it crumbles down. If you haven't read it, you owe it to yourself, okay? <laughs> I imagine these guards are at the tomb with this welder's cap on. And they're, you know, sealing this thing per perfectly shut. Nobody can get in there to take the body. And that's where our scene happens today in the gospel, where Mary and Mary are walking toward the tomb, and they're sad. They're grieving. Everything that has happened over the past few days, it's just swimming in their head. They're trying to make sense of it. And they're not bringing anything to anoint the body. They're not going to be able to get in there. They're just coming to witness. They're coming to sit in silence for their friend, their teacher. And that's when the earthquake happens. Now, we all know what an earthquake is. We have science behind it. We know that plates move, rocks jostle back and forth. Dynamic power and, and fury happens underneath the earth, and the stress releases and explosions, and, and the upper layers start to move, and then the upper layers start to move slower, and then, of course, it gets to the surface, and we feel the reverberations of it. If you've ever been in an earthquake, it's not that simple, I know, but still, we, you get the idea. We only get the surface of it. We don't see the explosion, the dynamics that are happening underneath the earth. In the Bible, whenever an earthquake is mentioned, it talks about the power of God. Or it also talks about this is the manifestation of God's presence right here. So God is shaking the entire earth at this moment that Jesus is resurrected. And they're feeling it, all of them. And if that's not enough, an angel descends and takes that sealed stone and moves it. And then he sits right on top of it. And this guy is glowing white, like Moses on the mountain, like Jesus in the transfiguration, revealing God's glory. And those guards that have been standing there watching the tomb have just witnessed crazy things. They're supposed to make sure that nobody takes the body out of the tomb. And now all of a sudden, there's an angel in glowing white. An earthquake just happened. The stone moved all by itself. We're, they're never going to believe that this is going to happen. We're, how are we going to tell them? Gonna, and then they pass out. <laughs> and the angel looks at the Marys and says, do not be afraid. This is an important phrase. Do not be afraid. This phrase is associated all the way back in Scripture with God's promises, God's covenants that God made with God's people. Do not be afraid. You can go all the way back to uh, Genesis in the creation story. Whenever our first parents are in paradise and they do something they're not supposed to do. And of course they hide. And it tells us that they hide out of fear of being found out, fear of being seen for who they truly are. That fear sets in. Later on in the gospel, I mean, later on in the, in the Old Testament, God meets with Abram and says, you're going to have so many kids, it's going to outnumber the stars in the sky. I will be their God. They will be my people. Do not be afraid, he tells to Abram. Don't hide from me. I want all of you. Do not be afraid. And then he, God speaks to Abraham's son, Isaac. When he's about to have a baby, he says, do not be afraid. Don't you hide from me. I want all of you. Do not be afraid. Then God speaks to Jacob, Isaac's son, who's about to go into Egypt. And he says, do not be afraid. Don't hide. I want you. I want all of you. Moses speaks to the Israelites in the wilderness where they're just like lost. Do not be afraid. Don't hide. God wants us. Isaiah speaks to the people of exile. Do not be afraid. God is with us right here, right now. Don't hide. God wants all of us. This phrase is so important that Matthew includes it not once but twice, and it's not put in there to quell the fear of those women. Oh, no, no, no. Generations have used this scripture to talk about the, uh, uh, the hysterical ninnies that, that are just need to be quieted down and, 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 and not have the fear of God put in them. 
These are the bravest people in Scripture. They're the first witnesses of the resurrection, these women, these Marys. These are the first apostles, the ones that are sent to share the good news. And they're the reason why we are worshiping here today, because we know he has risen because of their message. Not the men. The men fled. The men betrayed. The men denied. The men hid. The angel looks at Mary and Mary and says, do not be afraid. I promise you that the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and Isaiah and all the prophets is calling you. Go on ahead. He is risen. He's not here. He's going to meet you. You will see him. Go tell the others. And they take off running. And I can just imagine at this point in time, as they're running, those tears of sadness are now shifting to those tears of laughter and tears of joy because they have just been in the middle of the most earth-shattering experience. It's real. All the things that they learned in the life and the ministry of Jesus have come true. And they're running and they're talking about it. Do you remember when he called us? And, oh, he was healing this person and he fed this person. He touched that person that was unclean. He predicted this was going to happen, that he was going to die on the cross. And then three days later, he's going to rise again. And he did. It is real. He is risen. And then Jesus is there in front of them. And they fall down on their feet. And they begin to worship him. And they're holding on to him, their Lord and their Savior. And he looks down at them. And what does he say? Do not be afraid. Don't you hide from me. I want all of you. Go and tell the others. They will see me too. What a message. So what about us? Luckily, none of us are afraid, right? What would it look like if we were to go right now out into the neighborhood shouting, He is risen! And right now you're afraid I'm going to ask you to really do it. <laughs> What stops us from such conviction of faith? What fears have hold of us? Do we need an earthquake to prove that we don't have to act that way, to, to be that way, to feel that way? What is the thing that we're fearing the most? What's the stone that needs to be removed in our lives? Is it a person? Is it an experience? Is it a past issue? Is it a resentment that you have? What's the stone that needs to be removed? You don't get to do it. The angel does it. Do not be afraid. God is calling us to go for it. Do we need a glowing angel to come down to tell you it's okay? No, we've had it. Do not be afraid. Don't hide. God wants all of you to go out and share this amazing good news. And the message is simple. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Just as he promised. Amen.